great. So during fall orientation at a college in Massachusetts called Smith College, several years ago, students walked in to find something that they were not expecting. And they were moving into college and all the nervousness that comes with that. And they walk in to their freshman orientation and they see the failures of the ones who went before them, the sophomores, the juniors, and seniors, just projected on the walls everywhere. Things that read like, I failed my first college writing exam. I failed out of college. Sophomore year, a whole semester of Fs on my transcript. I was asked to leave junior year. I ran out of money. And this one is my favorite, if you can have a favorite failure. I accidentally submitted a 2 a.m. journal entry instead of a final exam to my English professor. And the presentation was a part of a new initiative they were starting there called Failing Well. And a leadership development specialist named Rachel Simmons started this because what she was noticing were that so many students who got into schools like Smith, very elite schools, they were used to, by the time they got there, having to be nearly perfect just to get in. That throughout their college experience, the first even just like smell of something that could maybe be a failure would just cripple them. And so she started this class that people could enroll in. And when you went into failing well, you would get a certificate that looked something like this. And it was a certificate of failure. And this is what it read. You are hereby authorized to screw up bomb or fail at any one or more relationships, friendships, texts, exams, extracurriculars, or any other choices associated with college and still be a totally worthy, utterly excellent human. Yeah, we can clap for that, hooray. And when I read this story, I thought of the texts that we're gonna be in tonight. And I wondered if Rachel knew anything about Jesus' breakfast on the beach that he served to Peter. See, if I could sit and have coffee with every single one of you today and hear your story and your background and where you come from and what you walked in with this week, your doubts, your failures, your fears, I would likely tell you, if not all of these three things, at least one of them. And that is that you are going to be okay. And you are going to fail. But by God's grace, you've got to get up. See, I've been in youth ministry for a little while. I've been a, both a youth pastor. I've been a small group leader. I've served the food. Like, if there was some kind of role to be done in youth ministry, I've been an intern. Actually, the church I was an intern at is here, Pinedale Christian Church. Yeah. <laughs> I've, been, I've done so many different um, things in youth ministry, but the thing that breaks my heart the most is when I see a student who is so alive in their faith and on fire for God experience failure of any kind, whether it's failure of someone they know and love, whether it's a tragedy in their life that's made them question their faith, anything that makes them feel like their faith has failed, and they decide, that's it for me. Like I'm closing up shop on this Jesus thing, I can't do this. And what breaks my heart the most is because I wonder if they knew that there are ebbs and flows of our faith, that we will experience failure, that that is a part of the gig, that following Jesus, we will experience failure in that. We are almost promised that. But I love how my friend John says it. He says, the gospel doesn't start with our resume. It begins with our deepest need. And that's where we're going to be tonight. If you have your Bible, we'd love for you to turn to John 21. And as you turn there, I want to set the stage for like the emotional temperature of where we're at when we get here. We're going to look at a story about Peter, and if I'm honest with you, in all of Scripture, Peter is who I resonate with the most. 
He had a big mouth. He was passionate, impulsive, opinionated. Any opinionated friends in the house? Yeah, a few, I figured. I heard some of you during the game. And he often would be the kind of person that would speak before thinking it through. Like some of you have done this, where you like visualize the words that you're like, how do I get them back into my, right? That was him. A few months ago, I was at my son's baseball game. And um, so the coach of the other team that we were playing, we had played this team before. And let's just say that he is one of those people that is still on his journey with God, all right? All people can be redeemed. He just has not been redeemed yet. And so he was super mean, like super mean to the kids on his team, super mean to the kids on our team, mean to the parents of his like, kids, mean to the parents on our team. Just like, you know, just dark inside. <laughs> Sad, mean, dark. I don't know. Anyway, had some issues. So he's yelling. He's yelling at everybody. And, you know, I'm just trying. I'm like, again... I'm just a spicy soul. And so I'm like, okay, Anne, just calm down. And I don't know if any of you guys are like this, but it's like if somebody is mean to me, that is totally fine. It's when you're mean to someone I love, right? It's like, yeah, it's both holy and then not, right? It's like, Holy Spirit, hold me back, and also I'm full of rage, right? Okay, so... This guy is yelling, and my son walks onto the mound. He's a pitcher, and there was a rule in this version of Little League, there's so many versions, where on Sundays you could pitch three innings, but you could only pitch two per game, okay? So we were playing two games that day. The coaches forgot that rule. The ump forgot that rule. My son walks out to pitch his third inning. And this guy, a grown man, these are 11-year-olds, okay? There's no scouts in the, I mean, like, they're not about to get a college scholarship, all right? And this guy starts screaming at my son, that kid's a cheater, get him off the mound, he's been cheating all year. Okay, this is like a grown adult, okay? And I'm like, be an adult, be an adult, be an adult. No, don't talk to my kid like that. It just comes out, I'm like, oh my God, like, okay, yeah, well, the problem was is that I was right behind home plate, and so the ump, was in the middle of telling my son, Keegan, what was going on. Like, hey, you need to get off the mound. You're done pitching for this game. So he just hears this random chick scream, don't talk to my son like that, while he's giving him just the rules. Super pleasant person, right? So he turns around and he says, who are you? And I was like, oh, I'm a random mom. I'm so sorry. And I like ran down to the end of the field, almost got put in Little League jail. But I say all that to say, like, I get Peter. That was his vibe. Just a lot of, like, oh, I didn't mean to do that, or just a lot of, like, fire-ready aim type of situations. But the thing about him is that he also spent three years constantly in the presence of Jesus. Like, he had heard Jesus teach profound things. He had seen Jesus perform many miracles. He was deeply loved by Jesus. He was in the inner circle of Jesus. Peter was in the room when Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. When Jesus asked the disciples who he thought he was, it was Peter who said, you are the Christ. It was Peter who got out of the boat on the Sea of Galilee, gripped with fear. Peter saw Jesus have power over nature. Jesus told Peter that he was the rock on which he would build his church. When Jesus told all of his disciples, all of you will fall away, Peter declared, I will not, not me. And when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was Peter who gets out a sword (laughs) and talk about unorganized, hacks off the ear of one of them. I mean, I doubt he was going for an ear, right? Like, that's kind of embarrassing. Like, but just like, ah. And just before this ear incident, as Jesus is preparing the disciples for his crucifixion and burial and resurrection, he says something to Peter that has really just messed with me the last few months. And in Luke 22, we read this. Simon, Simon, which would have been another name for Peter, pay attention Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, which would have meant just to like pick someone apart. 
But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter responds by telling him, like, Jesus, I am willing to die for you. Like, I am ready to go to prison for you. How could you possibly say, when my faith has failed, what are you talking about? And then Jesus tells him, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. The word that Jesus uses here for failure is a word called eklepo. And what I find so interesting about this word is it's the word that we would use for eclipse. How many of you got to see the eclipse this last spring? How many of you were in it? Yeah, all right, amen for earth. And I loved it. Um, so why this has messed with me is I was um, in an area in the path of totality. And before this spring, to be honest with you, you guys might think I'm an idiot for this. I did not understand what that meant. And all of a sudden, the city of Indianapolis is like, doom! I mean, it was like, everybody's coming! I mean, and all I know is that people come to our city for racing and basketball. And so I'm like, people are coming for Earth. This is so fascinating. And so the highways are shut down, our kids are out of school. I mean, it was like, the moon is gonna go over the sun! You know, and so, I mean, no joke, a truck pulled into the, like, we have grass next to our house in between the next neighbor, and a truck just pulled into it, and they were like, we're from Kentucky. I mean, it was like, what is going on? So, yeah, okay. Excited about the eclipse. And so, at three o'clock, the sun is still super bright, but it's like the moon is starting to go over the sun. And I'm gonna show you a picture of what I could see in this moment of my daughter, Eliza. Tell me when you guys can see it. Yeah, there she is. She is ready to go. And as you can see, she is, I mean, it's still pretty bright, right? And that's at like 3.02. And so it's like happening. Our whole neighborhood is counting down. Like nothing has brought us together more than the eclipse. And around like 3.06, it happens. And the moon passes over the sun. And for a moment, it feels like the sun is just gone in the middle of the day. I want to show you a picture of just a few minutes later of my husband. I don't know if you can tell, but it was so dark in our neighborhood within five minutes that the porch lights kicked on, thinking it was night. The lights all over the streets kicked on. My house got so dark, my cats, who I I'm on a journey with, thought it was nighttime, so they were like running around the house in the middle of the day. They were so confused. It was wild. And that's the word that Jesus is using here. Of like, when your faith is eclipsed in a way that blocks your view of God, turn back to me. See, the enemy's tool is often to position us and put something in front of us that blocks our view of God. But the thing about that is, is that it is not permanent. And yet so often in those moments we feel like God is gone, but God is very not gone. We for a moment cannot see him, feel him, know he's there, but he is very there. So back to Peter, it happens. He denies Jesus three times, and a few verses later, Luke tells us that while Peter denied Jesus, in the middle of the act, the rooster crowed, and Jesus turned and looked at Peter. And while he was denying him, Jesus saw him, and Peter saw Jesus seeing him. I don't know if you have ever been like caught in the act, or sent a text to someone you did not mean to send a text to, but that like pit in your stomach, imagine that times a thousand, and that is what Peter would have felt. Like while he is doing the thing he just said he would never do, Jesus is looking at him in the eyes. And that emotion, that place, that shame-filled spot is where we find Peter in John 21. Because while Jesus has died and risen again, Peter is still clearly carrying enough shame that Jesus pursues him to have one more conversation. So I want to start in verse 1. You can follow along with me in your Bible. 
Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee, and this is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. Now what you need to know is that this scene would have happened before. Like this would have felt familiar to Peter. It would have felt a little bit like deja vu. He had been in a boat before where he had caught nothing and then God showed up in his boat. Jesus often draws us back to him by reminding us of when we met him. See, in Luke chapter five, Jesus got into Peter's boat after a very unsuccessful night of fishing and Jesus says, like, I know that you haven't caught anything. And when Jesus tells them where to go for fish, he realizes, Peter realizes God is in his boat. And he is like, (gasps) and he flips out. And he's like, get away from me. You want nothing to do with me. I am a sinner. And Jesus told him there what he is going to remind him of here. You are more than that. And from now on, you're going to be not just catching fish. You're going to be fishing for men. I have more than this for you. Don't be afraid. So let's continue in verse four. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? And the word that he uses here for fellows is like children. <laughs> like, like he's being playful. Like little boys, have you caught any fish? Like Jesus isn't actually wondering. Like he's God, he knows. Have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore for they were only about 100 yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. So right off the bat, like, this is such a chaotic scene, right? Like, Peter is putting on more clothes to dive into the sea. Chaotic. And then he's in a boat. He probably could have gotten to Jesus faster, just, you know, a little rowing. And I'm sure the disciples are like, dude, like, we can get you there. But he is so desperate to see Jesus, he just jumps into the sea, puts more clothes on, and just starts swimming. He has got to find him. He doesn't take the time to calculate his next steps. And when they get there, they find breakfast waiting for them. And I just find this so fascinating because Jesus would do something like that. John includes this small detail that I think points so to who the character of our God is. What kind of fire, you guys can talk to me, what kind of fire does he mention that they show up to? Charcoal. So there's only one other time that a charcoal fire is mentioned in the New Testament, and it's right before this when Peter denied Jesus in John 18. He was standing around a charcoal fire trying to warm himself when he denied Jesus the first time. And here he shows up to breakfast, desperate for Jesus, and he shows up and he smells the smell he would have smelled in a serious failure. I don't know if you have any scents that bring you back to any kind of memory, but isn't Jesus so kind? That he recreates several moments for Peter of connection, of like, I see you, I know you, I love you, remember me in the boat, remember me in the water, remember me over the fire. In the moment of Peter's greatest failure and shame, he recreates the miracle he first used to call Peter to walk with him and the smell he would have smelled while denying him, both at the same time. So then Jesus asked him to bring some of the fish they caught, and they counted 153 fish, which all I have to tell you about that is that (laughs) just like, if you caught 153 fish, you're not going to say, yeah, 150, that's fine. No, they're like 153 specifically. Um, And Jesus told them to get breakfast, and they know it's him. 
This is the third time they'd seen him since he resurrected. So let's keep going in verse 15. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time, and he said, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. And in this one awkward, over-a-charcoal-fire conversation, Jesus affirms for Peter, not just with words, but by recreating so many senses and memories and connection, saying his name, He affirms two things for him that I believe he wants to affirm for us tonight. And that is his identity, that he is loved, and his purpose, that he is set apart. See, notice Jesus calls him by name, which would have been a sign of personal connection. In his deep understanding of Peter, Jesus knows and values him as a person with a name before anything he can accomplish He is Simon, son of John. And he assures him of his value just with that alone, of like, I am calling you by name. I know you. I have not forgotten you. I have not given up on you. Do you remember what I told you earlier about that word eclipse and how the enemy's strategy in our lives is often to block our view of God in a way that makes us believe he is gone? That is this moment for Peter where his failure has eclipsed his view of God in a way that just like made him cower in shame. And he had warned Peter about this moment of like, when your faith fails you, turn back. Henry Nouwen writes that there are five primary lies that we believe about our identity, and I see these show up not just in youth and in student ministry, but in my friends and in my own life as well. He writes, the five lies are, I am what I have, I am what I do, I am what other people say or think about me, I am nothing more than my worst moment, and I am nothing less than my best moment. And I don't know which lie is hovering over your mind, right now, but I am telling you it's a lie. And that Jesus will pursue you to remind you of who you really are and what your purpose really is. And in one conversation, Jesus rewrites all of those lies for Peter. Because Peter is not what he has. Jesus did not need fish. He had already cooked breakfast. Peter isn't what he does. Even in his deepest failure, Jesus finds him and recreates this moment of connection and love. Isn't Jesus so kind that he would want even the smell of charcoal to not leave a sting of shame for him? He's more than his worst moment. His success is not his identity and he is not what other people say about him. He is not Peter the denier, he is Peter. And so many details Jesus is creating, the boat, the charcoal, the water, to tell him, you are not what you've done. You are who I've died for. And there where the smell of the charcoal would have brought him back to so much shame. Just a few moments earlier, Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? See, I don't know what you've imagined God is like in your failure. I don't know what words have been spoken over you that you have equated with the voice of God. But if you've imagined that God's voice is one that says like, on the other side of the shore, like, get over here. Or if you've imagined that in your failure as you are down, that he's been like, you're down, well then stay down then. 
If that's what you've imagined, I want you to hear and see this story that our God is the kind of God who cooks us breakfast on a shore, is kind, is loving, is pursuing, is gentle. He's the kind of God who recreates miracles to open Peter's senses to remember who he is. And he creates moments of connection to show us he wants to be with us. Like, we don't make breakfast for people we don't want to be with. We don't. And Jesus asking Peter, do you love me three times after his resurrection is an act of restoration. Those three questions would have canceled out in his memory those three denials. And then Jesus sends him on his way, but more, most importantly, doesn't leave him there. He points him toward the future of not just do you love me, but then he points him to something else. See, like Peter, I have denied Jesus plenty of times. Maybe not in the same way, but I have denied him through prayerless life, through caring more about what other people have said about me than what he thinks of me. I've denied him plenty. And Jesus still pursues and pursues and pursues to remind me of who I really am. A few months ago, I was having just one of those weeks, and I don't know if any of you have had one of these weeks before, where you get to the end of the week and you realize, I think I kind of forgot about God this week. (laughs) Maybe none of us are brave enough to admit that, but I was having one of those weeks where life was just hard. Every part of my life, it was just like, there were little fires everywhere. And I was trying with all my might to fix everything on my own of like every skill I could think of, every tool I had. And I got to Friday morning and I was exhausted. And I was driving and I was like, oh my God. (laughs) Mm, This could have been easier on Monday if I would have just like taken a moment to be with you. And I just said out loud in my car, Jesus, I miss you. Will you just come be with me this weekend? which might sound weird to some of you, but then I just want to tell you what the Lord did for me. And it might not mean that much to any of you, but it was so personal for me, and I believe he does it all the time. We're just not looking for it. That next day, I got to drop my daughter off at a gymnastics center for a birthday party. And I have lived back in my hometown for 15 years, and I have never been back to my home gym where I grew up except this day. And so I drive back to the gymnastics center where I grew up. I grew up there until I was like 13 years old. And I walk into the gym and the smell of like feet and chalk, and I mean, it's disgusting. But it brought me immediately back to exactly where I was at 12. And that was when I met Jesus. And I walk in and the gym owner, her name's Dana, and she's still there. And guys, it has been a while, okay? And so first I was like, Now, I hope no one takes offense to this, but I really was like, I can't believe she is still here. You know, like, I mean, because she was older and a grandparent when she was my coach. So I was like, I'm proud of you, you know? But I walk in and she says, Ann Durham, which is my main name. And I was like, yes, Dana, is that you? And so then we get to talking and she's like, what are you doing now? And I was like, I'm a youth pastor. And she looks at me and she's like, you're a Christian? And at first I was kind of like, Am I wearing the wrong shirt or something? Like, what what kind of question is that? And then I remembered, oh, she has not seen me. (laughs) She's like, I can't believe you're a Christian. Dana introduced me to Jesus. She would have devotionals before our practices, and she would pray over me, and I had no idea what any of that meant. I just knew that she was taking prayer requests, which every week I was just telling her about my parents and their divorce, and she was praying over me, and she was saying, Jesus cares about you, he loves you. And so then when I started going to church, I remembered Dana's words. And the next day, I got to go to my son's baseball game, which in 15 years have never been back to the same field on the other side of town, but just coincidentally go to the exact same field I grew up on, where my small group leader would pick me up from practice to take me to church as I was getting to know him. And that smell of gravel just immediately reminded me how far God has brought me. And whether those just happened or whether God gave them to me, what I know is when we're paying attention, we see how much he is pursuing us all the time. And the thing is, as you draw near to God, he will often take us to our places of wounding. 
And he will say, like, we got to deal with this. And maybe for some of us, that'll be this week with your small group leader or with a counselor at home or with a parent. But as we process that wounding, he's not just going to leave us there to wallow in it. He wants us to heal for the future. And he will say, we got to deal with this for the future because then he points Peter to his purpose. And he tells him to feed his lambs, feed his sheep. And these lambs would have been, you know, just like baby tinies who are dependent on anyone to feed them. Like they're not making it without a person, right? If you've been around church for any amount of time, you have heard, or if you've just watched National Geographic, you know that sheep are like nature's victim, you know? Like it's not like, I mean, birds can kill them. You know, like it's not good for them. Like they can be within a few feet of water and die of dehydration. Just like, uh, you know, it's just like, it's not great. And he's like, feed my sheep. That he's talking about us. But he's saying, like, look up, get your eyes up. Do not sit here and wallow. Look up at the world. It is full of need. There are lambs and sheep to care for. We cannot sit here in shame. Don't get so wrapped up in your past that you forget I have a purpose for you. My grace is sufficient for you. So Peter, let's heal this thing so we can move forward. And I believe he says the same to us tonight. He doesn't dismiss sin or shame. He died for it. And he doesn't just move on. He says, we got to deal with this now. Feed my sheep. And so then he continues in verses 18 and 19. He says, I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. And then Jesus told him, follow me. See, in his purpose, Jesus reminds him that while you are following me, you will still experience suffering. And he warns him, like, Peter, you are going to face things, but you got to follow me however hard it gets. He promises to be with us in our suffering and despair because those stories he can redeem and use for those who come behind us. And after Jesus told Peter to follow him, he does something that I would totally do. And in the verses later, he's like, yeah, but John, like what about him, you know? Like what are you gonna do with him? And Jesus is so direct with Peter. It's like, That is none of your business. Like what John does is what John does. What I have for you is what I have for you. Follow me. Some of us are eclipsed by this. We can miss what God is doing in our life because we are so focused on what he's doing in other people's lives and comparing and wondering if we measure up. Following and walking with Jesus was his business, not what he was doing in anybody else's. There's an old story about a philosopher named Diogenes who was alive around Alexander the Great. And I love this story because while it seems ancient and old, and it is, there's a truth in it that I think still we have so much to learn from. See, everyone looked up to Alexander and they worshiped him like God. And so much of his life was fueled by criticism in his teenage years. He wanted so desperately to be liked because of what other people said about him and that he wouldn't do or that he wouldn't be. And some of us know exactly what that is like. And so Alexander the Great, He was great, and he conquered the world, and he goes on this victory tour through Corinth, and everyone is cheering for him and shouting, like, Alexander, you are great, you're incredible, woo, and he's like, I know, I'm the best. And the thing is, is that this philosopher, though, Diogenes, all Alexander wants is Diogenes to pay attention to him. And the reason why is because Diogenes does not care. Some of you know what that's like, right? Where it's like so many people can give you praise, but the one person you're looking to doesn't care. That's that burn that he's feeling. And so he's going through Corinth on this victory tour, and he realizes, like, where is Diogenes? The whole city's here. Why is he not here? 
And his messenger tells him, well, Diogenes couldn't make it. And he's like, where is he? He's like, he is sunbathing. He's like, I'm sorry, what? He's getting a tan. He couldn't make it to the victory tour. And so, as you can imagine, Alexander's like, no, I'm not down with that. And so he marches and he finds Diogenes and he gets his crew with him and Diogenes hears them coming and he is unbothered. He is just laying there getting a suntan. And Alexander the Great comes and stands over him. And again, this is like the most powerful man in the world standing over you of like, why aren't you here for my tour? And Diogenes' response to him is, mm, you're in my light. I'm trying to see the sun here. Get out of my light. Guys, like that, I, I like read that. I was like, that, I mean, bold move, number one. But also, how confident would you have to be in yourself for someone to stand over you? Like, where are you? And you're just like, mm, need to see the sun. Why do I tell you this? I tell you this because can you imagine what would happen if as a follower of Jesus, you had the kind of confidence in God that when your failure came to stand over you and try to tell you who you are, when sin comes to stand over you and tries to tell you who you are, when doubt comes to stand over you and tries to tell you who you are, you would be so confident in who he is and what he is doing that even if it is eclipsed for a moment, you know God has not left you and you say, get out of his light. Like, you're in his light. Get out of his light. And so I want you to do something for me. I want you to, in your mind, put that thing in front of you that eclipses your faith. Like if it is a doubt, a person, a fear, a failure, a sin in your life, whatever it is, whatever threatens to make you forget about God, I want you to just put it front and center in your mind. And then I want us to practice this together. And the few first few times we can say it quietly until it's not awkward anymore and then we can say it loudly together. But when you've got that thing in your mind, would you just raise your hand up for me? Okay, most of us are ready. Just say this with me. Get out of his light. 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 See, here's what I need you to know. We can say that out loud and God can reposition you so that you no longer cower in shame but delight in the confidence in him. Because on Pentecost Sunday, just a few pages later in the Bible, it is Peter who preaches. The same one who had such shame and guilt just a few pages before that. And he said words like this, I saw the Lord always before me for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. That is the kind of person who has the confidence to say, get out of his light. My God is with me. And God gave him the Holy Spirit in that moment not because he was good, but because he turned back to him. And in John chapter 1, John begins his gospel by saying, the word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness can never extinguish it. What I want you to hear tonight is that if you are in a place this week where you feel like your faith has failed, I want you to know that this is not the final moment of your faith. And what does he say to Peter? Remember what he says? He said in Luke, when you turn back, you can strengthen your brothers. See, your story of struggle and despair or shame or guilt may be what God uses to strengthen the ones who come behind you. And so what I want you to know is, you are going to be okay. You are going to fail, but by God's grace, you have got to get up. And you can say it out loud. You can say it in your school, you can say it in your bedroom. It might be a little weird, but you can say it to a person. You can say, get out of his light. 
Get out fear, get out of his light. Shame, get out of his light. Sin, get out of his light. Failure, get out of his light. Comparison, get out of his life. He has a purpose for you. If you still have a pulse, he is not done with you here. And in Psalm 34, four through five, David writes this, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. I've started doing something recently that I wanna just let you guys borrow and if it means something to you, hooray, and if not, you don't have to do it again. But I've started praying with my face up recently. Because I don't know about you, but I am prone to shame. And there is nothing wrong with the posture of repentance and bowing down, and I think that is necessary, but I think what is also necessary is a face that is up toward God, confident in him, and confident in what he wants to do in us. So as we pray and as we finish the night, I want you to, some of you, it'll be the first time, I don't want you to bow down. I want you to practice praying with your face up. And what will it be like for you to have confidence in who he is? That you can fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. That you do not have to cower or stay in a place of failure. That you can rest because you are set apart by him and he will not let you go. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the story of Peter on the beach. Thank you for the reminders that you give us along the way that you are still pursuing us. And Jesus, I pray for every student in this room that you would meet them exactly where they are tonight, that you would give them exactly what they need and that you would remind us this is not the final moment of our faith if we feel like it's failed. And if it feels like the moon is blocking the sun, God, remind us that you are still very there and you will not let us go. Amen.